As it is. Right, so let's start. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those of you who don't need to know me, my name is Rohan Rikumasuri. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Smart uh, Infrastructure. It's my great pleasure today to welcome you all to this seminar, uh, given by Senior Professor Pascal Perez. Uh, I could talk at length about Pascal and his uh, inspiring work here at Smart, but uh, because it needs to be uh, yeah, I showed I could get uh, his, his bio that I will read out now. So, Senior Professor Pascal Perez is a world leader in part secretary modeling of complex systems. He's a co editor of Complex Science for a Complex World, exploring human ecosystems with agents, uh, published by AMUT Press. Before joining the University of Wollongong, he has been a team lead at CSIRO and as an associate professor at the University of Toledo Australian National University. Pascal Perez has 30 years experience working in Southeast Asia, Western Africa, Pacific Island countries, and Australia. He's also serving on Urban Growth New South Wales University Roundtable as JW representative and on the Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network's National Academic Committee. More recently, Professor Perez was invited to join the Infrastructure Data Collection and Dissemination Steering Committee set up by Mr. Paul Fletcher. Professor Perez has a long standing interest in studying social patterns and individual response to policy incentives or regulatory constraints, as well as the influence of demographic change on the sustainability of urban transport and health choices. His final modern work on illicit drug and alcohol issues in Australia was internationally recognized. He has also led groundbreaking work on monitoring and modeling perceived durability amongst residents of Southeast Asia. I was fortunate to work with him in that way. So coming back to today's uh, topic, uh, his topic today is smart cities, the good, the bad, and the ugly. As we know, smart cities is a word casually thrown around, so we ought to uh, hear from an expert uh, who knows what he's talking about. Um, so without further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Senior from Paris uh, to the floor. Just, um, Thank you, Alain. It was possibly low-key first seminar of the year in the full house uh, and quite impressive. Uh, it, well, uh, yesterday was my birthday and listening to these resumes, oh my god, I'm, I'm old and boring now, definitely. Um, so the, this talk again we was supposed and I hope it will be enjoyable and light. Just summarizing uh, where we up to uh, with this uh, Internet of Things and more specifically the Digital Living Lab uh, initiative that UW and SMART have uh, engaged in since last year. Uh, and reflecting upon a couple of discussions we had with the industry, with colleagues from uh, INSAT in, in Toulouse in France who visited us last December. Because I think everybody's excited about smart cities around Australia and around the world. Unfortunately, as we were discussing uh, in this part that just before this talk, uh, there's a lot of unknown in these smart cities, and for the moment, we're sweeping them under the carpet big time, but they're going to come back and bite us. So it's probably up to us researchers to have a look at these issues, uh, engage with the industry and with the users and clients warn them about these issues and probably try to find solutions and there's plenty of young people in this room who are already working on these solutions. So bear with me. Yes. Okay, so a few figures you've seen these things before if you're a little bit into IoT and smart cities. It's happening. You know, it's not an if issue, it's a when we're gonna be totally invaded, our privacy will be invaded by these smart objects. Uh, if, if you, these are Cisco figures, pretty well, oh, sorry, pretty well known one, once, uh, yes, uh, from 2017 last year. So in 2005, we had 5 billion connected objects at large and mainly uh, the mobile devices we all know. And the really smart things, these little sensors that you know, work on a battery, they were just you know, 0.5 billion on it. So a small proportion of the whole thing. If you step forward nearly where we are now, so figures 
uh, probably around 20 billion of its connected objects in total. Again, a lot of these mobile devices, but more and more of these really smart objects, the new generation. Projection from Cisco, by 2030, we're going to have 50 billion of these connected objects, and 40 billion will be made of this new generation of things, connected ones. Whether they're going to be smart, question mark, but they're going to be connected. Okay. In the same time, interestingly enough, this is the growth of the population from you know, 6 billion, 7 billion, 8 billion. So it means they're going to have more and more of these things per capita in the world. So from probably on average, at the moment, it's four per capita. Uh, in 2030, it's going to be probably 20 or 20 uh, per head. Uh, and he's included. So that's the scary part of it. Now, it has to be live, so, and I love this movie. So <coughs> we're going to see these guys again and again, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what's the good about smart cities and Internet of Things applied to smart cities? Well, first, it's some kind of, in theory, a Lego block game. You've got these little objects there. They can be asset trackers, gas monitors, water meters. You Heard about them and you've seen them on TV. They talk to <coughs> something that's called a gateway, so it's an emitter receiver uh, that gets all this information I'm here, I'm here, temperature, temperature, water level, water level, get all this flow of data into the cloud, the magic cloud, white magic, most of the time. And then uh, this information, uh, because the data here is pure data, has somehow to be transformed into information, is processed by back-end applications. In theory, it's very simple, and in theory, everybody can do it. And we've got uh, people here, researchers, who are already being able to implement this kind of, of uh, uh, environment end-to-end. Uh, -end. Okay, so you can do it. It's um, back to the old time of the uh, uh, first generation of uh, individual computers. You were like myself, or if you're old enough, you were hacking your own computer. You were buying spare parts, uh, you're not going to uh, JB Hi-Fi to buy it uh, very cheap. No, you're doing it yourself. And most of the time, you're doing a poor job at it. But that was the thing. That's the same. But in this case, it can be for the whole city. So that's, that's good. What's even, even better, and not why it is so disruptive for the one, probably most of the people in this room know what I'm talking about. It's a boring for you guys. But just re reminding everyone about the basics of what why this IoT is so special? Why can't we do all this with mobile phones? Okay, we've got 3G, 4G, 5G, and these phones are becoming more and more powerful. Well, first is because IoT, as it stands, especially the uh, application for smart cities, uses sorry, uses a wave band between 800 and 900 uh, megahertz, which is non-licensed around the world. So basically, it's not a telco wave band. Anybody can piggyback on it and do something with it. It's not regulated yet. Because it's not commercial, we don't have to pay a fee. Okay, You don't have to subscribe to something. You can do whatever you want. It's long range because this is low frequency. If you go back to your uh, lessons in physics at school, long wave travels long distances. Right. So it means that one emitter receiver can talk or hear, listen to sensors very, very far away. For Wi-Fi, you've got Wi-Fi at your place. You know, get out the uh, door and a couple of meters away, that's it. You're back on 4G. With these things, we've got a couple of gateways that have been installed, and I'll come back to it, around, around the region. We have one gateway in Monkira. Monkira can listen to sensors 60 kilometers away. And this is the maximum we've got for we can listen even further away. We've got one uh, agricultural tech uh, sensor. We don't even know who owns it, but uh, our Mount Kira emitter is able to detect it. Low power, because it's low frequency, long range, it doesn't use a lot of power. And that's the key thing you've probably heard in the news. These sensors, they can last for years on a small battery. No more wires, no more changing battery every two weeks. Fantastic. That's a theory. Yeah, I'll come back to it again. But in theory, yes, small sensor, no wires, talking 10 kilometers away to an emitter that's going to send this, this information, this data through the cloud, 
and transforming the unique information. Great. You're going to have smart parking, you're going to have smart lighting in cities, and you're going to have all other applications. Low cost by definition, you don't have to pay for anything. Small batteries, small sensors, or everything's cheap. Two things we have to remember about IoT. Latency first. Latency is the time for the signal to be received and processed. It's much, much slower than your 3G, 4G, and even 5G signal. Okay, so remember that it's going to be slower. So if you want to send things every millisecond, you might have a trouble there. Most of the applications for the moment, they don't really care about that. And this is for the certain class of these sensors, and I won't go into it. The key killer here, and is Tanya in the room? No. Uh, we used to joke with it, but why did we call this bloody thing Internet of Things when you cannot download Netflix movies with this bloody thing? Because the packet of information you can send are very small. It's a long wave slow wave and it only transmit small packets of information okay around 122 bytes and again there's a lot of discussion in the industry but that's it so temperature temperature i'm here i'm here water level water level. that's it nothing more nothing less but you can do a lot of things you know? so that's all the good at uh, the good things now let's talk about the bad things about uh, the implementation of IoT for smart cities in particular. That's one of these in Russia from Council in particular in Australia on their website. And I've, I've picked on on uh, City of Adelaide, but uh, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not just pinpointing point, at them. I think they've done a good job with, with their strategy for smart cities. Just the graph itself, which is emblematic of all the other graphs you can see. Uh, around the world about smart city. You've got the city, and then you've got all these little things, the smart sensors, they can do everything by their own. And then somewhere in the picture, you've got people. In here, you can even have trees. That's why I love this one. It, is, it feels like an afterthought. It's like, yeah, but the city is smart at all. Okay. There's people in the cities. Okay, well, let's put people. Oh, there's trees. Yeah, let's put a tree. Why on earth is this smart city a green city as well? I have no idea. Why is this smart city smart for people? And how these people will become smarter because of all these sensors? We have no idea and there's no demonstration so far beyond the glossy brochure and strategies that these cities are putting in place. And I think that that's the big, big bad thing about smart cities for long. All these glossy um, uh, brochures, they start with smiley people on the Cover page, you turn the first page, and it's all about technology and sensors and radio communication. And the people have disappeared from the equation. I'm not even mentioning the trees. Another bad thing, I think, which is totally related, of course, to, to my first point, when you start forgetting people from day one, well, uh, there's no surprise when you sense, like the uh, city of Melbourne did a couple of years ago, uh, surveys, questionnaires to, to people around the city say, well, are you excited about the smart city strategy and implementation in Melbourne? And nearly no, no one answers the questionnaire. And the only ones who answered basically were for 90% of them a big question mark saying, we don't even know what you're talking about. And, and to be fair, there were the people from the city council who were mentioning that, say, guys, we've got something wrong because we cannot engage with our communities. They don't even understand what we're talking about and what we're doing. Uh, in the streets and any part of the city. And if you reflect upon it, and, and don't get these figures as, as you know, really uh, uh, safe figures, it's just my personal estimates. But in Australia, at least, I do consider that when you read again on websites, in magazines, when you hear radio or, or watch TV about smart cities, it's always about livability. Smart cities will improve our quality of life, will improve livability in cities. So people, when you ask them, and in the US they've done some surveys, say, when, when you think about smart city, what, what do you think you want out of it? And there's a beautiful uh, survey from, uh, I think it was Cisco, we did it two years ago. Top of the shelf, uh, the, yeah, I've, I've got, I want a smart watch and, and a Fitbit. That's for them, that's the smart city concept. Okay. See? A smart car, number two. 
and then you've got all the smart appliances within the house. Okay? And if you do the same in Australia, I'm pretty sure we're going to end up with the same kind of results. And really, the smart city application, they come very, very far away in the ranking of the people about what they want and what they think is about. What's happening in our cities for the moment, it's all about smart meters, smart parking, and I love this one, smart street lighting. Who the hell is going to tell me in this room how a smart street lighting will improve the quality of life of people in one of one city? It might. Don't get me wrong, it might indirectly. But directly, how can we convince the residents, the citizens of, of these cities, that this is going to be beneficial to them? I know it's going to be beneficial to okay, the people who are putting them in place, but not the citizens so far. So we're doing this, and people are seeing that. Guess what? There's a little bit of a disconnect. And for the moment, I can't see how we can call this a revolution, because for me, being French, and every 14th of July, celebrate the revolution. Revolution starts and ends with people. And for the moment, the bloody revolution we're talking about as a smart city starts and ends with sensors. It won't work. You thought it was bad? <laughs> Stay with me. Okay, the ugly part of it. Uh, that's more or less um, by two, two years ago, I think the, the, the landscape hasn't changed very much. All the so called standards in terms of radio communication uh, that support the Internet of Things in cities for the moment. Um, just remember that in, in an IoT uh, environment for a smart city, you've got the sensors, you've got your gateways or your base station, that's the radio communication part of it, you've got your cloud solution to send your data into, and then you've got your backend application. So here we're talking only one component of it, the radio communication aspect. Only for that, you've got for the moment around the world roughly between 14 and 16 standards for radio communication. You've heard about Sigfox. You, of course, I hope, know about LoRaWAN uh, in, this, uh, in this region because we've implemented a, a network. Uh, there's also narrowband IoT coming in. There's CAT M1 that Elstra has been advocating for the last two years. And some of them are licensed, also you have to pay a certain to the telcos, other ones are still uh, in, in the uh, non-commercial way then. The problem you've got here is that most of these so-called standards don't talk to each other. So if in a city for the moment, as it is the case in Hong Kong, you've got Sigfox and Laura one, good luck because they don't talk to each other. And nobody is in a hurry to have them talk to each other because there's too much commercial interest in keeping them apart. So well, that's the new part of the, the, the ugly one. There are some attempts from the telcos, so don't make me say that the telcos are really the bad and ugly ones in, in the system. So especially in Europe, telcos are conscious of the problem and they try to fix it. And they fix it with whomever wants. So Cisco Europe is talking to Dutch Telecom, France Telecom, Orange, uh, in order to try to get a standard and they make some good progress on it called 1M2A. Problem is that it's it's a commercial standard, so it's, it tends to be encapsulated very quickly in the platform that these telcos are developing. But at least they try to have these things talking together. So basically, any sensor that could talk to a France Telecom solution should be able one day to talk to an Orange or a Dutch Telecom or a Cisco solution. Okay. And I'll come back to the standard. So when you've got 14 to 16 standards around the world about Radio communication only, and again, I'm not talking the cloud solution, the application, or the sensors, just the radio communication, which should be the smallest and easiest part of the equation. I'm not talking about standards. When I've got 14 of them, it's not a standard. It's whatever you want to call them in English or in French, it's not a standard to me. Standard is one standard, not 14. And that's the situation roughly. Um, if you, anywhere uh, around Australia, you've got uh, a city where you would have uh, a narrowband IoT network. So here are all the smart devices. Uh, here are some of these gateways, so getting this information from these little smart sensors. And then you've got your application uh, getting this information through the cloud, for example. And then it happens that in your city, you've got a Sigfox network as well. 
and then you've got the LoRaWAN network. Three different networks, three different net gateways, as you have for 3G, 4G for the moment. You've got your Vodafone and your Telstra and your whatever else. Yes? What the industry is saying is that for the moment, they're integrating. It's all seamless, but it's vertical integration. So all the LoRaWAN solution, they come with backend application, with the gateways, with the sensors, and they all talk to each other seamlessly. Fine. Same with Sigfox, and hopefully same with narrowband IoT, when we're going to finally get some sensors, because we don't have sensors for the moment for narrowband IoT in Australia. Um, that's OK. But that's not what we want for smart cities. We want for smart cities council being able to pick up a couple of solutions with LoRa one because they are the cheaper or the most effective one, but also having some Sigfox on narrowband IoT, and probably a fourth one where you, we haven't heard about it, because these things will probably die off within the next five years, and we don't know what the next generation will be. So if a council for the moment, and I'm, I'm just fixing on council, but it could be SMEs and startups and whomever else, if you invest now into one technology and one vertical stack, you have no guarantee that this stack will be able to talk to other stacks or the next best thing in the future. That's a lock-in situation. And there's no coming back from it. You won't be able to retrofit your getaway, but it's going to cost you a fortune. So what the industry is saying is that, oh, but no, it's all under control because we're using REST APIs for all these things to talk together. OK, that's fine. So REST APIs means, OK, it's a client-server uh, relationship. So the application knows the gateway and knows the sensor. They can exchange information for it. Of course, it works, except that for a REST API to work, the client needs to know the server, and the server needs to know the client. Everything has to be known. So within the vertical stack, it works. There's some cases where between the vertical things, because you're sharing enough information, you might know what the sensors are about and how they're structured, and you can grab information from this application. Not very often, but in many, many cases, there's no way your application here using narrowband IoT will be able to discover something it doesn't know, which for smart city is the key. We want an application in the back end say, tell me where are all the temperature sensors in the city? Tell me where are all the water quality sensors in the city? Regardless of the radio communication sensor, I'm sorry. From a user perspective, this shouldn't be the structuring factor. The structuring factor would be what type of sensor I have and what type of application. And for the moment, what you've got in smart cities is the fact that this component here is imposing the rule of the game to everyone else. If this was not enough, there's another big thing we, we, we tend to sweep under the carpet. Is, you've probably heard that, not only these IoT, they're cheap, uh, they've got a long range, uh, and it's going to be fantastic, but also you're going to be able to hook on thousands and tens of thousands of sensors to one gateway. So very cost efficient in terms of upscaling. I'm sorry, we've got no studies whatsoever around the world except few ones in, in, uh, in the US. In the real world, not in the lab. In the lab, we've got plenty of studies in the lab with a couple of sensors. We have no studies for the moment telling us from a practical perspective, how many sensors you can really hook onto a network or one gateway in real time. And the few, the, the, the few studies that came out from the US for the moment are not good news. So when uh, a radio communication uh, system said, oh, you're going to be able to install, uh, thousand, let's say, 2,000 sensors talking to this gateway at the same time, well, reality proved that actually, as soon as you reach 200, you start to have a problem. And I won't enter detail of the radio communication process, but for simple radio communication process called ALOA, yeah, when, you, when you've got 200 sensors hitting your gateway at the same time, exactly the same time, you start to fall down. And this is the kind of study that our colleagues from INSAT in Toulouse have started looking at. And this is purely theoretical for them because, again, we don't have the, the real-world experimental design to test that. At least the takeaways might have them, but it's not public information yet. 
if you look at that, it's just from a simulation model looking at, depending on the number of device, devices attacking uh, a gateway, the throughput, so how much information you can pass on into the system. Don't really uh, look at the uh, um, uh, formal values here, but just look at that. So this is when you want one sensor to talk to one gateway only. Uh, this means that you don't have to triangulate to, to know where this sensor is located. Just You just want to send information. Water level, water level, water level, and this is my ID. <coughs> this is the kind of shape you're going to get. So the more um, sensors you're going to get past a threshold point, then your throughput comes down, back to what I was saying. And, and the more you're going to try to put, the more collapse and the faster the collapse is. Now, if you try to triangulate, this is something that the industry is saying that one day you're going to be able to triangulate moving parts with these smart devices. Well, if you want to have one device, again, this is purely theoretical, um, trying to attack three gateways in order to be able to triangulate by definition, this is the kind of throughput you've got. And again, we've got this collapse as soon as too many devices. This is just theoretical, this is just a simulation. We have no idea in the reality when you're going to have thousands and thousands of gateways and, and hundreds of thousands, if not billions, of these sensors, what's going to happen to you? If you're not, if you're not scared now, <laughs> I'm not sure what I can do. OK, that was just to scare you off. Uh, now, th 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 there's a couple of ways forward. And, and I hope that the University of Wollongong and, and the Smart Infrastructure Facility will we, we contribute to develop these solutions for Wollongong, for the region. And, and, and hopefully post-trial. First, let's look at, at the ugly part of it. Uh, that's that's the, 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 the one um, that is probably the most pressing one. So that's what I call the real IoT interoperability. And, and for the ones who were able to attend uh, uh, the presentation from our colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor sorry, Thierry Monte last December, uh, they are the forefront of the open source version of this interoperability. I won't make a, a full course on, on 1M2M, and there's, this presentation is on our website, so you, you can download it. But basically what 1M2M tries to do, and again, it's pushed by the telcos uh, around the world, especially in Europe, they try to have a structure where anything is discoverable. So any kind of device across any kind of radio communication system and protocol, across any kind of cloud-based or not cloud-based data handling, and across any kind of application, which are formally registered to the system and follow the 1M2M protocols, they should be able to be discoverable. That's a key thing, to discover, to be able to discover. And you can discover only if you create an ontology to describe things. If you don't do that, you can't do it. So again, a REST API system without an ontology will not help you to discover things. How does it work? Um, well, again, when you see this, you say, hey, that's the way it should work. Well, for the moment, it doesn't work like that in terms of discoverability. It works only for the vertical stacks I've mentioned. You've got uh, a gateway here, and here you've got the application, the backend application. So through a 1M2M uh, protocol, you would have both registering with each other according to a specific ontology, saying this is who I am and this is how I work, and this is I am the application, and this is what I want. Then, you're going to have all these devices, here it's a smart meter, it can be anything else, registering with the closest gateway. And again, through a specific protocol, a specific ontology, see, this is who I am. I'm a water meter, and this is how I, I spread my data. This is the kind of security I have, and so on and so forth. And this is the, the privacy uh, um, constraints I have. This is totally public data, or this is just for this kind of application that are allowed to get this information through. On the other side, your end user does the same through uh, the same uh, unified protocol uh, through a subscription process, and then redirect all this information, and the gateways have to know what's going on on the sides. <coughs> this is the only way it can work. And when you've got a new value coming in, that's where the system can seamlessly provide information, your backend information, regardless of where this smart meter is, regardless of who built it, and regardless of what kind of radio communication it uses. 
Okay, it seems to be perfectly logical. Um, we far, far, so we can do this for the moment within one radio communication protocol. That's what these people are doing. And see the whole system. Another problem I mentioned, which is the fact that we have no idea in terms of throughput what's going to happen. Well, we need, we need to do the hard work again here. Uh, we need to set up simulation model that can handle the problem. And again, our colleagues from INSAT, uh, with some of the Italian colleagues, uh, have done a, a fair job at, at starting creating simulation models about throughput for relatively simple radio communication uh, protocols. And they're going to try to uh, um, complexify them as time passes by. What we need to do now is to replicate this in reality. And I'll come back to it for one more minute to leave you now. But we've got something to work on, and they're happy to collaborate with us uh, on this thing. <coughs> Solutions for the community part, the people, re encapsulating the people into it. And that's where, of course, many of you have heard about the Things Network. You can go to the web and see their, their uh, um, video there, what, what they did in Amsterdam four years ago. Uh, it was the whole concept was to put the people at the center of the smart city revolution from day one. Building the networks with people, building the solutions with people, and, and building the application with people, for people. And Vinker came here. He was the one who uh, uh, officially opened our uh, uh, IoT uh, Open Hub uh, upstairs. Uh, and he's the one who encouraged us to do the same as Amsterdam <coughs> did uh, four years ago. He said, well, Wollongong should be the Amsterdam of Australia. And that's what we did. The key thing with the Things Network, they use the LoRaWAN radio communication protocol, which is one among others. Um, but the key thing is an open one. It's the only open protocol we have so far for Internet of Things. All the other ones are proprietary ones. Sigfox uh, or Narrowband IoT, uh, they all already encapsulated uh, through commercial interest. Not only that, but uh, because they try to listen to the needs of uh, their, their users and their communities around the world and, and thinking about smart cities here, they've done two things last year, very, very interesting already. They thought, okay, many councils, for example, I'll pick on council because I see some of my colleagues here. They're going to start with the public application. So the data is, can be shared with anyone. So you can discover it and take it. Air quality, temperature, water level, people in the street. Then there might be some of these applications that will probably include sensitive information. And some council or some businesses will want to re encapsulate this data center. We can't share this with everyone. So this means that you need to have a private solution for Internet of Things. So you can start prototyping public, and then you have to move into private. So what the Things Network have been doing last year is to offer the possibility to move. And we haven't tried yet, but in principle, seamlessly from purely open public data to private solutions using the same stack, the same cloud solution. But in this case, you have a private box. Of course, the public access is free to air. So anybody in one room with what we've installed can access the system for free. If you ask for a private solution, there will be a fee. It will attract a fee, but that, that makes sense. Not only that, but you can uh, also think of, I don't want to use the cloud solution, the Things Network solution. It's a good one, but I want to use my server or my cloud solution. What they offer now is, again, a seamless transition from public solution using the Things Network cloud to a private solution where you can use your own cloud solution for your own server. And the whole thing moves seamlessly from one solution to the other one. Well, that's why we chose to go with them because of the philosophy of it and because of the technical solution they start implementing, uh, listening to the users. So what we've done here in Wollongong, you all, uh, many of you were at the launch, so you, you know what I'm talking about. The name is important, Digital Living Lab. It means there's two components. The digital lab is the technology. Yes, okay, we know that. Living Lab is the key, people. We need to engage with people from day one, and that's what we did. It has to be, and it is, a knowledge hub. We want to share the love, share the information, share the expertise. It's a design and testing facility, and we've got uh, Johan Bartolini, who's the head of our uh, IoT lab here at SMART. 
and there's other colleagues who contribute now to a broader uh, source of knowledge. And of course, it's a community IoT accelerator. And we, uh, I mean, I mean accelerator, because we've got many colleagues from the UW accelerator already contributing to projects with the digital agenda. And these are some of, of the uh, companies we, we're working with. Of course, there was the, the launch last year. Just to give you uh, uh, a timeline for what has happened, um, the, we thought about the open lab to share information and share the law. And we opened the lab in September 16. We talked to the Chancellery about this digital living lab as a crazy idea for the University of Wollongong to do what these guys have done in Amsterdam. We do it for everyone. And, and, and the Vice Chancellor uh, said, yes, okay, let's do it. We're going to pay for it. The University of Wollongong will do it for, for the whole region, for the whole community. Uh, this was in January when we got the acceptance. In May 17, we launched the officially Digital Living Lab. Uh, by December, we had six gateways uh, um, installed and 20 projects at different level of maturity in the pipeline. So that's how fast it happened. And I think people were involved in it as to achieve themselves a rush. They go that fast, yes, it went that fast. So where are we now? Phase one was the creation of the Smart IoT Hub. It was in September, launched by my colleague Vinke Eastman. And we've got pizza and, <coughs> and hacking nights here. Everybody invited, people from SCS, from uh, fire services are coming, uh, and schools are coming in there. So, and we've got STEM classes uh, in there, so that's great. Phase two was the deployment of the Lara network. I promised during the launch that by end of August, everything will be done. Uh, I'm French, so I'm not good at it. In timelines, uh, <laughs> but we, we have Benoit, where's Benoit? Oh, it's not here today. Uh, Benoit Passo, our, our coordinator for mm -hmm. the Digital Living Lab, uh, and coming from the industry. Thanks to him and, and, and his gentle pressure <coughs> on everyone. Now we've got six gateways across <coughs> the whole region, uh, covering nearly 100% of the uh, Wollongong and, and Shell Harbor uh, area. Uh, and probably the most striking victory we've had is we managed to get one of these. Thanks to our colleagues from Wollongong City Council who have been fantastic partners to us. We've got one on Mount Kira, and this one is a killer. This one got a 60 kilometers radius. You can hear anything in 60 kilometers radius, except in the shadowing areas, of course, especially at the bottom of this carbon. Phase three, the community project. Today, 20 projects. Projects about flooding with uh, um, uh, Wollongong City Council, aged care facilities, um, about aging independently at home or having livable uh, aged care facilities. Uh, we're working with the private sector, IRT, and Warrego, but also Kayama Council. Uh, they run, they still run their own facilities there. Accessibility, you've heard, probably most of you have heard about before Christmas, this smart wheelchair project we've launched. Uh, and it was advertised in media quite extensively. Um, and got some interest from Google now. Um, traffic, air quality, uh, a lot of work on air quality. <coughs> Safety, we've got uh, you here who won an award uh, from the uh, uh, service, Australian Service Society last year uh, for something which, again, seems to be a no brainer being a, a volunteer firefighter himself. Uh, mapping fire hydrants anywhere uh, in, in Jeringong first. But Jeringong was the first in Australia, if not in the world. Now we've got it for Wollongong, just telling the firefighters in real time where the fire hydrants are, especially at night when they're searching for it, and they have a house fire to extinguish. <clears throat> Again, that was community driven. It was not us coming up, no, it was, there was a need from the firefighters to get something operational. So where are we up to it? That's going to be my last slide. In terms of working, we have two objectives. Working on IoT interoperability through the digital living lab and smart contributing with all the colleagues from the university and the community IoT aspect. So for IoT interoperability, as I mentioned, we've got six LoRa one gateways in place. We've got one Sigfox gateway on the roof. Um, and we've got an agreement to use this gateway for public applications as well, not only their own private application. And we're still negotiating uh, with Vodafone and Telstra, we <coughs> try to play one against the other. Point to have narrowband IoT being switched on in the region as soon as possible. Why? Because 
back to my point, we want the SMEs, the startups, the councils, anyone in this region and researchers to be able to try things across these different networks. Capability to prototype and test sensors and gateways. We can build literally a network from scratch here. And, uh, and Johan has done it already with a, with a small gateway, uh, Laura gateway. Capability to teach IoT end to end design and implementation, and that's where we've got strong interaction with our colleagues from the faculty. Collaboration with INSAT to demonstrate one and two M, uh, OM to M, so the open source version of it as soon as possible. So we want to take some of these gateways and start retrofitting them with firmware that would support 1M2M standard, demonstrate the value in, in doing that, but also pay the cost. There will be a, a significant transaction cost to do that. And finally, collaboration <coughs> with inside to experiment network throughput. I'm very excited about that one. We've got a network we control. This is our network. So we can start hammering. We can build as many sensors we, as we want. We can hammer these gateways and try to have real data to measure what's the real throughput of these systems. On the community IoT side, we've got Smart IoT Hub, uh, which, which is an open space to share information and expertise, which you want to come, if you want your students to come, if you want your colleagues to come, your kids to come, please, it's up here, it's already open uh, and uh, to, to anyone. Council projects, a few examples, uh, and some of them with, with one one council here. Uh, smart storm water, smart parking, smart air quality. SME project, of course, we've got this smart beer keg with binary beer. Everybody has heard about that. Um, that's a fantastic success story for the region, for binary beer, but also for the university and the accelerator. Smart wheelchair, uh, again, uh, we, we had a, a good exposure last year and we had a, a teleconference with them yesterday uh, to move into the next phase. Uh, and smart indoor environments uh, with our colleagues from Enviro, again, on the accelerator, on the accelerator. Uh, by the way, the next project we have is to have this building being finally smart, not capital letters, but more letters, uh, where we're going to equip each room in a smart building with smart sensors, uh, and we're going to display this, hopefully, as soon as possible, into a 3D model of the building fed by real-time information. We want the wow factor for the so And we're going to work with, with Enviro uh, on that one, and our colleagues on Dedica for the uh, for the 3D rendering. Community projects, shark detection, that's a fantastic uh, story. Uh, a 14 years old kid at the time working with Matthew Berman and developing this shark detection uh, system and being invited a couple of months later to New York by Amazon uh, Cloud Services to present what they've done because they couldn't even realize what a 14 year old kid could do with a couple of colleagues from University of Green. Uh, and this project continues to go now with. They try to find this thing correctly. The last funding that we got is to link uh, drone imagery to the app with direct analysis of the images. Uh, smart fire hydrants, I mentioned it. Contribution also a very important thing for us. And we still think it's part of Digital Living Lab. Digital Living Lab doesn't have to be geographically bounded. Uh, you might have heard that UC Warrongong uh, uh, is helping City Liverpool City Council with their smart city and suburb. Uh, project that's been successful. The Illawar region was not successful, but Liverpool Council was successful uh, with their uh, lead to the federal government. And the project will be about tracking people in the CBD of Liverpool uh, and uh, also uh, exposure to air pollutants and see what is the best design of the city centre in the future in order not to track individuals. It's not the topic of the project, but tracking how crowd move around in order to have more livable and, and more healthy, and healthier uh, city centre in the future for Liverpool. That's it for me, that's where we are, and I invite all of you uh, to continue to contribute to the Living Lab in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Questions to Pascal. Pascal, really interesting talk. If you enjoyed it, I missed the first nine and a half months. Ah, which is those are the interesting no, no, no. arguments. Okay. Um, two deep questions. Um, we use the idea of smart IoT networks and smart cities. IBM coined the word uh, smarter planet. Great. And then they generalize and said smarter X, where you potentiate X with whatever you like. 
some of the interesting things that happened. Um, so, so they had a progression of interesting buzzwords. So we started with service science, you mentioned that, which was huge. Then they graduated to Smarter Planet and Smarter X, and then they went on to Commodore um, Computing Watchers. I was at IBM for a sabbatical um, uh, One of the interesting things I found, and so I want to have thoughts on this, um, they were entirely focused on data logging. So a smarter city for them was one where they would collect lots of data from traffic lights, from water sensors, etc. Um, but the bigger vision was about the idea, and that's how I read it. The bigger vision was to actually optimize, to offer deep decisions with the data being collected. Um, and I asked my IBM colleagues then, what are you doing with this? So where are you going with that aspect of this? And the answer was, um, we're pretty busy collecting the data. Right? So we'll get to the books of data. I think we never got to the data. So I want your thoughts on that aspect of this. I mean, we obviously can collect lots of interesting data, but when and how are we going to graduate to the idea of offering deep decisions with those kinds of data? You probably know my, my answer with the uh, uh, I think that, interestingly enough, when, when you look at the, 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 the very start of smart city, start, the, 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 and there's another slide about the, when the whole thing started. In 95, 96, that's when MIT Boston that's coined the term. And when you look at it, it's the collapse. It's really a collapse. It, it's not a coming together. It's not a fusion. It's a collapse of two totally different concepts. One, which was the, the concept of smart development for cities, which is coming from new urbanism from the 70s and 80s. So these this were a bunch of urban planners, probably the best we've had uh, in, in, that, in, in this century, uh, rethinking urban planning. And it was all about people and the built environment. There was no technology whatsoever in there. But they were building cities for people, by people, blah, blah, blah. So this was really going up. Uh, at that time, in the mid-90s. And at the same time, you had these guys at Cisco, IBM, already thinking all this data thing and these sensors and, and machine learning. How and why, and probably because it was MIT Boston, the two things collapsed together. And that's when Smart City came up. So these millions of sensors producing terabytes of data, and you put machine learning on top of it, case is solved, you're going to solve all your problems in your cities. Which was the new urbanism issue. And I, I think we haven't disentangled this original thing. Uh, and that's why we, we're talking about people, because it's the urbanism thing. But the big driver are these guys who are just after selling, sorry about that, nobody from IBM here, selling servers and selling their machine learning algorithm, fine and stuff. And as long as us, users and researchers, we don't <coughs> change the tag, force them to change the tag, we're going to continue more of the same. And um, um, we discussed this before. I like machine learning. Some of our guys here are fantastic at doing machine learning. I hate deep learning. Deep learning is nothing more, nothing less than black magic. And uh, it's very sad. When, when these companies use this term, you know, Google and IBM, deep learning, this is rubbish. You know, some of us are old enough to know that these algorithms have changed. A genetic algorithm is still a genetic algorithm. Uh, um, evolutionary computing is still evolutionary computing, except the computer is faster, bigger, and it can merge things. But the logic of it hasn't changed. So, yes, we, we're going down the wrong path with these guys. Are we going to force them to concentrate on people again? Not sure. Okay. How many people in this room have seen three films made by Adam Curtis for BBC Two in London called All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace? <laughs> it's the history of computing. And when we started off with computers in California, it was the great utopian dream that all we had to do was everybody would have a computer, everybody would talk to everybody else, and we'd have this democratic revolution because all this information would be spread through society. What have we got? Google, Amazon, it's been privatized. So we're seeing the same thing, I think, in this situation with, with IoT, that there will be an enormous move to 
financialize it and to capture benefits private. Yeah, well, this is what, yeah, I agree with you, and, and that's where I mentioned very briefly the smart street lighting. I think for me, this is a Trojan horse. But there will be good application of it. Don't get me wrong. But the way the the the, the, the commercial uh, structuring around this smart street lighting start to creep around the cities in Australia and around the world, it's scary because it's nothing more, nothing less than the private sector trying to get its hands on what's going to be the future blood line, blood network of the cities in the more information. <coughs> So I hear very similar to that because I, I like the disconnect that you showed between the, the narrative that people say and what, what happens in the show. Because most of us who are old enough to remember those the narratives about internet, you know, freedom, liberty, mm -hmm. you know, we're gonna have uh, you, know, uh, you know we can have empowered people essentially. And the reality of course is that we have the biggest monopolies on the planet. One part of the thing which I think maybe you mentioned very briefly is that there is a sort of amplification of vulnerability happening there. We are now more vulnerable than before because this has been amplified and the barriers, physical barriers that prevented us from being more exposed to Ukraine, for example, now is removed. So what would prevent a virus being leaked from NSA going to somewhere else causing the shutdown of Wollongong? Or the water system in Wollongong, things like that. So we are suddenly become more vulnerable than much than before. Uh, so the commercial interest, of course, will create commercial monopolies, but it would amplify all, all, all vulnerabilities. So that, that's a sort of dialogue that I think we should also incorporate. In this, I yeah, and, and in touch, yeah, a very good point. Now that I think not, not that we know Thomas are here, but they would be the one talking mm -hmm. about this, this aspect of security. But we, we had a meeting with them before, before Christmas and tried having the two teams collaborating on, on security of, uh, of Internet of Things and smart cities. Um, I'm sorry, but it's not just about security and encryption. I'm talking about the fact that we're creating complex systems which become, if you like, more unreliable. Yeah, no, and that's also my point. So, we, we all know that the next step uh, will, will be edge computing, so spreading the calculation rather than pushing all the humongous amount of data into the cloud. We're going to have the nodes themselves, the devices, the gateways to pre-calculate as many things as possible in order, which makes sense, to send only the useful data, not even yet information, but data to the cloud and to the application. Well, when you do that, you're creating more entry point in your system uh, for, for hackers. So, by the sheer numbers, yes, this system will be highly vulnerable, regardless of the safety system we put in place to protect them. But instead of having two entry points, you're gonna have tens and tens and tens of entry points and, and physical hardware. So some people say, okay, well, as long as these things, they push temperature, temperature, water level, water level, and there will be so many of them, it won't, it won't create much of an incentive for hackers to go into the system, disrupt it. Uh, big time. It's going to need a lot of, of energy and firepower to do that. But these guys are not stupid. They're knowing what's happening now. That to update these systems, we all, many people around the world are already working on, on firmware oh. updates. And the, as I mentioned, because of the latency, the system is pretty slow and, and small packet of information. So sending temperature, temperature, temperature is pretty, pretty fast. And if a hacker gets into it for even 15 minutes, yeah, you're going to get. 15, 15 minutes of hacked data, so be it. Updating the firmware on your sensor, your gateway, might, with the LoRa technology, for example, might take hours to update the whole firmware mm -hmm. because it's going to be small information coming up, dripping down literally. How much damage can a pre well informed hacker, knowing when the firmware will happen, to disrupt the firmware? And in this case, it's going to disrupt the firmware update of thousands and thousands of sensors. That's going to be hell. And it's not if, it's when, when it's going to happen. We've seen this with automated cars. It took two weeks in California for the guys to start playing, literally playing with the system. And I'm not talking about the Volvo car. I took like, you know, 3,000 cars trial. Within two weeks, the guys were into it, just playing with it. 
So scary, yes. What you say? I just made a comment in, uh, with this. Uh, it seems that business, right, is something that is natural and fundamental. When we look in terms of Facebook and Google, they actually start with a single guy that had an idea, right? So, and then that thing flourish and say, oh, there is money to be made here. So it's a natural evolution. So the solution is to have something that is good for the community and is good business as well. Otherwise, we will not leave. Uh, so that is a natural evil. It will happen and has to happen and has to be thought in the same global way. Continuing with this IoT, right? I think the other thing that has to be considered is how that can contribute for a uh, resilient city, right? In terms of adaptation, what that means. So it's not collecting data, but the smart guts to make this, the the city to adapt and to be resilient and to be better in whatever situation, right? It's well beyond, but think in terms of this whole system, just a, a big topic, but I think that IoT can contribute with that and we have to put the smart on that. Yeah, I think, and, and we've got people from Oregon Council here. I, I think what, what we put in the proposal to federal government that hopefully we're going to continue to work uh, upon together, regardless of the result of the bid, uh, on, on stormwater management, smart stormwater management for Oregon Council it is emblematic of what you just said. It's, it's not about the technology, it's about the solution. And, and we all know that last year was, was a terrible year in terms of, of flooding and, and, and casualties for Oregon. So, I think when we started discussing this months ago, it was okay, let's find a solution. Can, can IoT help finding a solution in terms of resilience? And, of, and if on top of that, it, it helps managing cost and being more efficient with human resources, sending people where they need it, when they need it, good. But that's, that's a perfect example of something which talks to productivity, and that's good, but also livability, because we're talking about lives at the end of the day, or protecting assets for everyone. Uh, but this is one example. Um, I think what we're doing with Liverpool Council is along these lines as well. How, how will the city, the, the, the city center of Liverpool cope with the, 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 the influx of, of population as, as that part of, of Sydney grows up uh, and fast? Um, and what will be the, the environmental consequences of that? So, in terms of pollution. And it's really about forget about the technology. We don't care about that. Technology will come after. We really need to think about what we want out of that. And I, I think that should be something that. We don't have a framework from that, just honestly, in terms of researchers, if we've got young researchers who search for a PhD topic, just that. How can we engage with potential users, the designers, uh, the end users or, or people who believe it in the system, in a framework where you can find first a conceptual solution and then you bring your technology into it? Because for the moment what we have, and, and people from council are the first one to know that, it's enemies at the gate. They've got the vendors who are the only one for them and providing the information. And of course, it's biased information. They want to sell their stuff. And, and I think we, we need to stop that because that's, that's toxic. And of course, it's a different thing. So. We'll take the last question. Um, it's not really like a financial organization, professionalization, maybe people out there. There's a lot of hype about blockchain, blockchain technology, and learning from that, or that's happening about central currency. Or uh, well, there are two aspects of blockchain for IoT which is interesting. One is security. Can we use it to guarantee an exchange of information which will be safer? The other one, I don't know if you saw, there's, there was an article, the, the Things Network got their, their own their international workshop this week, and we've got our colleague uh, Rodney Clark uh, attending the, the workshop. But uh, Vinka Giesman, the founder, released uh, an inter well, an uh, online newspaper recent interview with Vinka Gitzman. And they're looking at, uh, so they don't call it Bitcoin, uh, uh, unique co uh, ICO, uh, I can't remember what, uh, 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 a funding mechanism peer-to-peer uh, -peer within the system. So if I need a lot of information from you, uh, but you don't need much information from me, there will be some kind of monetized transaction that would use 
a blockchain principle and a Bitcoin kind of concept, but within the Things Network communities, which are nearly 500 around the world now. So that's the kind of thing creeping into the, the Internet of Things now, the security aspect and, and the peer-to-peer crowd funding of the system. Because the problem with the Things Network, they grow so fast and they still keep, and I love them for that, because uh, they could make heaps of money out of it, honestly. Uh, they keep this thing, no, no, it's community oriented and we want that. But I think this peer-to-peer -peer mechanism, they could fund the extension and the improvement of the whole system. So that's, that's a very very interesting question and very exciting times for that. Yeah, um, to add to that point, I, I'm seeing actually these two technologies are converging now, hmm. with IoT and, and blockchain that are upcoming projects. Uh, taking a moving moment to the internet, it's a company that's really called IOLTA. Yeah. But they are like, yeah. Uh, there are a few companies actually, so yeah. So I'm sure Pascal is around. With, with the limitation of blockchain, I was with an uh, uh, Israeli colleague a, a couple of months ago in a conference in Europe, and he, he gave a fantastic presentation on, on blockchain for, for internet, not, not for IoT. And he was saying, you know, it's all good, it works except upscaling, we've got massive problem with upscaling now. But in terms of security, we haven't solved the whole problem because now the hackers, they know that the two weak points in the process are the entry point and the exit point. So they don't try to uh, uh, get into the blockchain. It's, they know it's far too expensive uh, in, in terms of efforts. They just look at the mobile phone of the guy and, and how many guys store their uh, um, blockchain, uh, Bitcoin passwords on their mobile phone. And that's that's how the 15 million Bitcoin yeah, uh, have, been, have been slowly taken out of the system. Just reading well, the I hope you memorize it because if you get it, it's called forever. There you go. But again, so yeah, they would, they, there's always the black swan coming, <laughs> which is good for us, I guess, for such a I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for coming. And Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Let's turn this off. Yeah, yeah, it's good. So what is this now? After the Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before we get the recorded one,